Authors, welcome to Authors Love Bookstores presented by A Mighty Blaze. My name is Kimberly Hensel Lawrence, and I'm your host. We have a wonderful program for you today. Please let me tell you a little bit about our show before I introduce our guests. Here on Authors Love Bookstores, we bring to you a conversation between an author and her favorite independent bookstore to shine a light on storytelling and creativity, essential parts of our culture and our collective human experience. We talk about the books written by our guest author, and we'll also discuss what makes the indie bookstore we're featuring so special. We hope you'll be inspired to read our guest writing, buy a book or books from the bookstore we're featuring, and maybe even visit the bookstore in person. I host and produce this show with fellow writer Joe Moldover, and we're so glad that you're here. If you're watching live with us on Facebook or YouTube, feel free to post a question via a comment below the broadcast, and we'll get to as many as we can later on. Now. Let me introduce you to our wonderful guests. We are so, so lucky today to be joined by Sarah Smarsh and Danny Kane. Sarah Smarsh is a journalist who has covered socioeconomic class, politics, and public policy for the New York Times, National Geographic, The New Yorker, Harper's, and many other publications. Her, her just, her wonderful first book, Heartland, a memoir of working hard and being broke in the richest country on earth came out in 2018. It was an instant New York Times bestseller, a finalist for the National Book Award, a winner of the Chicago Tribune Literary Award, and, I, and many other awards that I am, I am missing. Um, Sarah's second book came out last year. It is also so good. It's about your favorite person and mine, Dolly Parton. Um, and it is called She Come By It Natural. Dolly Parton and the Women Who Lived Her Songs. So wonderful. Um, Sarah. Oh, Sorry, my computer just froze. Um, okay, what else about Sarah? She is a former fellow at the Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and a former writing professor. She is a frequent speaker and commentator on economic inequality, and she lives in Kansas. Danny Kane has been the owner of the Raven Bookstore in Lawrence, Kansas since 2017 when he took over after having served as a part-time bookseller. Founded in 1987, the Raven is a small college town, new only bookstore with a legacy of celebrating crime fiction and a current focus on poetry, political nonfiction and uplifting the Midwest. Aside from running the Raven with its very talented team of booksellers, Danny is the author of How to Resist Amazon, and why, and he's also written three poetry collections. In addition to all of that, Danny uh, is on the board of directors for the American Booksellers Association and the Midwest Independent Book Booksellers Association. He also won in 2019, the Bookseller of the Year Award from the Mid Midwest Independent Booksellers Association. He's a founder of the Paper Plains Literary Festival, and he is committed to finding ways to help bookstores create a better world for their communities. Welcome, Sarah and Danny. Thank you. So <laughs> glad to be here. Thank you so much. Okay, before we get into questions, I want to just let our audience know that we're doing a giveaway today for Sarah's latest book, She Come By It Natural. The book has been generously donated by Sarah's publisher. If you'd like to enter the giveaway, we ask that you, first of all, be based in the United States. Um, and second of all, that you post a question or a comment during the broadcast. And then our producer will choose someone at random um, at the end of the show. So Sarah, when you go to the Twitter page for Raven, you are quoted as describing the bookstore as Kansas's cultural beacon. <laughs> and then I read somewhere that it's the first indie bookstore you ever visited. Is that true? That is true. I didn't know I had previously divulged that information, but I would like to expand on it. Please um, do. And and I'm honored to be quoted in the uh, in the Twitter pro profile of the Raven, um, which uh, folks joining might know has an, an incredible presence on on the socials, as they say, thanks to Danny's wit and brilliance and and authenticity. Um, but but yeah, so I come from. If anyone joining has read my work, they they will probably know uh, uh, impoverished background. I guess would not be a, an exaggeration. And I I write about socioeconomic class and the various deprivations and also beauties that that go with um, coming up specifically in a poor rural white place. And um, my mom actually was the only 
education often is kind of goes hand in hand with one's um, propensity for book buying, both the interest in a cultural sense and, and also one's um, ability to buy books. And in my family, I was raised largely by my grandparents who left school in sixth and ninth grade, respectively, to uh, work in wheat fields and highway diners. And, and my mother was 17 when she got pregnant with me and, and didn't uh, finish high school. Um, so as, as far as like um, wh whether one is bookish, there, there wasn't space to even cultivate that aspect of, um, you know, one's um, uh, p potential um, personality and, and interests because we were busy surviving and, and often by way of manual labor. My mom, however, was a, was a reader. She was really the only reader in our family. And she got her, her hands on books by way of public libraries, um, garage sales, uh, sometimes used bookstores, but often those were even too expensive for, for her to afford. Um, but because of her devotion to the written word, and she herself was, was a natural wordsmith, probably would have been a writer had she had the chance. Um, our, there, there were some books in our house. They weren't necessarily, she was a big Margaret Atwood fan, I would say, mm -hmm. and that would be the, the, the more literary end of her taste. She was also a huge Stephen King fan, uh, who's also a fine writer, but there tended to be a lot of more like uh, popular novels on the shelves. Um, and, and that was my access to the concept of reading was when my mom picked up titles that had been out for a few years that were finally on a table at a garage sale. Mm. And I, of course, um, inherited my mother's um, taste for reading. And I, I was a voracious reader as a child. And, um, and all the same, um, it took being a first generation college student at the University of Kansas in Lawrence, um, about a two and a half hour drive from the wheat farm where I grew up, to, to ever um, have occasion to, to literally step into an independent bookstore for the first mm -hmm. time. There's a very fine bookstore much closer to where I grew up, Watermark Books in Wichita. But that, that life I was living, you know, 45 miles outside of the city um, didn't, there, there, it, it was like I, I was living in a different reality than, than the realm of the indie bookstore, sadly. Um, and, you know, I don't remember the reason. I was probably just walking around downtown at the time. The Raven was probably less than 10 years old, um, but already, you know, an established sort of institution in um, the, the wonderful downtown area of Lawrence that um, is, is full of independent uh, shops. And uh, it was like, I just, you know, the, the magic that, Folks who are joining this talk probably know if you're tuning into a show called Authors Love Bookstores, I don't have to explain that magic to you, but I felt it for the first time in the, the building of the Raven that Danny's currently joining us from. And then, you know, I could talk at some point in our conversation about how it was also kind of instrumental in my development as a writer and a, and a literary citizen, if you will. But, um, you know, that's um, the first cut is the deepest, as they say about love in pop pop. Uh, music. And um, so the Raven, it's in here forever. What is it about the store that makes it so special, makes it so like a, a destination or a place that, I mean, obviously the, the first bookstore is important and, and forms a, you form a relationship, but to burrow into your heart like that and to still be part of your life, there has to be something very special about yeah. this. Yeah, I think the magic of the Raven, um, it has to do with, I'm, I'm a little bit mystical about a lot of things, including um, uh, businesses and, and bookstores. And I think that the intention and the heart that goes into its foundation and its creation, um, you know, is will, will be sort of baked into its vibe forevermore. And, you know, it the, the Raven was and remains um, sort of a, um, I don't know. A rarity wouldn't be the right, the right word. There, there are a lot of, of, of great bookstores in the area and the region, but, um, but the, there's a reason I've described the Raven as a cultural beacon because, um, Kansas over the course of my life, I'm, I'm 40. And over those decades, it increasingly became sort of intertwined with a presumption of a, of a conservative politics. And that, um, 
uh, framework for the, the culture of the political unit that is a state um, often kind of, um, it, it, it doesn't go without saying here that we would support local business and that we would want a free exchange of ideas and that we would, um, you know, be having our minds opened to new perspectives by way of gathering in community. These, these tend to be apart from even the political sphere, just um, using the term liberal in a different way, liberal concepts. And while there are plenty of people in Kansas who embrace those concepts and live them, it's not a given on every corner the way that it might be in some place like Portland, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so that makes what the Raven is and does all the more special. And also I would say critical to the cultural fabric of the place. Um, and, and so that's part of it. And I already sensed that, by the way, when I walked through their doors, um, I at the time was was identifying as a conservative. Uh, I I, grew, I went to school in a, a small, I would say like moderately conservative town. This is the '90s before things got like insane um, on that that end of the political spectrum. But um, you know, my uh, I, I sensed it, it was like the way I'd been socialized was was to have a sort of fear based mentality about a lot of ideas. Hmm. And, and yet who I was by nature was kind of the opposite of that. And so the Raven was one of the places that allowed me to like feel, you know, the, the resonation with my own actual frequency. Nobody, by the way, was like um, at the university or the Raven, um, you know, trying to, they, they didn't have an, a liberal agenda to convert me. They, you know, like I think is, is as like often the, the conservative, um, um, conspiracy theory, but like uh, it, it just, it, it created a space for me to be exposed to types of people I'd never encountered, titles on spines that I'd never encountered. And at that time, frankly, I, I still couldn't afford to buy books, but I would go in there just to like absorb the vibe. Yeah. So much more than a bookstore, Danny. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I would agree. It's um, just listening. I could listen to Sarah talk about the Raven all day. Like, I'm honored, <laughs> like that. But it's not just because she's a friend and a fantastic author saying kind things about something that means a lot to me. But it's she truly gets it. She absolutely understands what we're trying to do and and calling it a space and talking about community. It really is more than a bookstore. Um, and I think any independent bookstore that's doing it right is, is working to build community, to expand minds, to introduce people to new ideas and new types of people. Um, and, and it's work we, we really value. And I'm um, honored and pleased to hear, uh, hear you recognize that um, because it's, um, it's, it's much more than selling books. I mean, we're building community. And, and the fact that um, I just love, um, even the idea of this show and appearing here with Sarah is, is like we, Sarah and the Raven, we lift each other up, I think. Um, like the, obviously we, we sell a ton of Sarah's books, which is great, but like we work together in, in many different ways. Like Sarah was, Sarah signed hundreds and hundreds of copies of She Come By It Natural, but like we also organized a protest together last year when the, the USPS was under attack, um, which it still is. But like Sarah and I were out there in the park, like, uh, you know, protesting um, and explaining the importance of the of the post office and a, a good bookstore author relationships do that. They they enrich each other and and the the authors help the bookstore and the bookstores help the author and that's that's truly magic and that's something you really don't find elsewhere. Um, and and that's one of many many ways uh, a good bookstore builds community. Do you think that this activist role or this this sort of community? Um, the space you hold in your community is uniquely Kansas. Is there something about where you are in the country that sort of elevates the relationship between writer and bookseller, between, between the book, the community and the bookstore? I don't, I don't know if it's uniquely Kansas. I, one thing I'll say about Lawrence is that for a long time, uh, like there, it's pretty deeply baked in Lawrence, the idea that it's important to support small businesses. And, and for a town this size in this region, there are a lot of thriving independent businesses, which is important. And it's something I really value about, um, about being here. 
Um, and that's in part thanks to efforts by people like the Ravens' original owners um, who, who crusaded against the, the Borders megastore opening across the street uh, and found a way to thrive when it eventually did open. Um, and so like a lot of the, the small business stuff I talk about and the activism comes directly from them. And I just view it as I'm, I'm continuing that work. Uh, but I think a bookstore is a really good uh, mouthpiece wherever it is for the importance of, of community and small businesses. And I think the bookstore industry has taken up the mantle of, of small businesses in a really important way uh, because it is such a great example of, of a business that's more than a business that can build community uh, and, and partner with local nonprofits and put on free programming and sponsor the Little League team. I think a, a bookstore is one very good example of the important work that a small business can do in a community. Speaking of one of the important roles that small businesses play, um, I had the pleasure of reading your, this is the, the original and I see behind yeah. you is the book. It became, yep. it started as this and became the book. And so um, for our audience, um, well, actually, Denny, why don't you tell our audience what uh, this is, how to resist Amazon and why sure. and how this came about? Yeah, well, that's a zine, um, and it, it turned into a book. Um, the zine came about, um, like I said, the the elevating small businesses and, and kind of talking about the dangers of corporate consolidation has been part of the Ravens' mission for a long time, and, and I continue that work. One of the ways I continued that work was through social media, mm -hmm. uh, and then... Um, through a series of, of, of coincidences and wonderful events, um, we started to get some attention for our activism. And I decided, um, you know, the, the, the discussion about Amazon and supporting small businesses happens really well and really helpfully within the bookstore industry. And bookstore owners are really good at talking to other bookstore owners about Amazon and its dangers. But I wanted to kind of take that conversation across the cash register. So I just made the little pamphlet um, that, that, you know, a, a bookseller can hand uh, a customer this, this zine, a uh, cheap little zine to kind of continue that conversation. Um, and I self-published it originally. Demand um, went crazy. Uh, hundreds of bookstores across the country and around the world wanted it. And so eventually I partnered up with Microcosm Publishing out of Portland to put out a version of the zine and they published it. Uh, it did well enough that they wanted me to expand it into a book, which I kind of relished because I learned a lot more about the policy aspects of this. Um, and originally, it was kind of based on consumer choice. You can see it from the title. And I think uh, making value decisions based on where you spend your money is important, but that's not the solution to the Amazon problem. The solution is really legislative. Uh, and so I expanded on that much more um, in the book and talked about antitrust policy. And like, even since the book is finished, there's been a lot of exciting stuff that's gone on, but the book is there. Uh, you can buy it through the Raven. I'm happy to send you a signed copy. Um, it's, it's just as much a case pro small businesses as it is anti Amazon. It very much, that's how it reads to me is it's a, it's a call to action or a love letter even to small mm -hmm. businesses and how vital they are to our communities. And I also think, Maybe their news is so insistent, right? There's so much happening all the time that it's hard to keep track of all of these reports about how big tech and big business hurt small businesses. And so I thought reading your publication, having it all in one place, I'm inspired to go cancel my Amazon Prime account. I, mean, <laughs> I think it's definitely worth reading for those people who are kind of questioning the role big tech plays in their lives. Mm -hmm. Um, speaking of something else that's like so amazing and I want everyone to read, Sarah's books. Sarah, I, I really, I, I spent this past week reading both of your books and I'm so grateful for that. Um, thank you. Like I really, your, your writing is so, it's so heartfelt and compassionate and smart. And I just, I, I, I've been telling everyone about this book um, and Dolly Parton, of course. Um, but I just felt that there was such um, wisdom and compassion in, in your writing. And I wondered if that was something, how do you, I, well, first of all, I can't be the only person who has said that about your writing. You must have heard that before, that people recognize the humanity and, and the story that you're telling and, and the way that you're depicting um, your family and the people you grew up with. I'm wondering how, how you maintain that sense of compassion and heart 
in this very difficult time, when we have such divisive politics, when we have all these policies that don't support working families, when we don't have always actions taken by our legislators to support, to lend a hand, when it seems like there's more judgment than community? Um, well, first, thank you for, for the lovely um, reflections on my work. Um, and, and before I answer your question, I want to say that I want from Danny a sequel, How to Not Colonize the Moon and Why. <laughs> <laughs> that one's pretty easy. <laughs> or you, at least like, you would hope. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that would be amazing. Um, but, you know, as far as um, my voice and the way that it lands for folks, um, I, I do I do know that 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 is a um, uh, a sense that that a lot of my readers have um, how you described um, uh, a sense of um, com compassion I guess and I know that because folks from very different walks of life um, even across the political spectrum but certainly um, uh, racially and and socioeconomically diverse swath of people around the world have said similar things, even though they're very different people. Um, so so there, mu there must be something to that. And I think that while that wasn't necessarily an intention, the way that I write tends to be, um, um, it just sort of comes, there's never like a, an intended audience, which mm -hmm. is goes against like, you know, some of the um, most common writing and advice. Um, no intended audience and honestly no real intent about affecting some specific change other than just saying something that I, I feel vibrating inside me that needs to be said and the reason and what it's going to do in the world isn't for me to decide. Mm -hmm. um, I think that if people um, sense an, an empathy or um, a gentleness within some of the, you know, very direct and not necessarily gentle ideas that I have, uh, that comes from the humility of having changed my own ideas about the world and the way that it runs and um, this reality that we are constructing together as a nation and as a world. Um, you know, I mentioned that that when I left the family farm, I was, I, I, called myself, I, th I think I would have said I'm independent. I went, when I, I voted in my first election uh, over 20 years ago, I was not registered with either party. I was raised to be very distrusting of government, um, but also just averse to even political affiliation of any sort, which is quite different from today most, you know, government averse folks are also, there's a, a pretty major um, Venn diagram of, of like an overlap with a very strong tribal identification with the Republican Party. Um, that wasn't the case for me at all, but I did think of myself as conservative. I was raised very devoutly Catholic in a rural uh, area in the Midwest. And, um, and over the course of my young adulthood, my, my ideas changed pretty dramatically, pretty fundamentally. Things that I thought um, were um, just this kind of like the, the framework when we, in which we were all existing and, and obeying laws, eventually just, it, it didn't happen overnight, but um, it eventually just totally collapsed. And then I found what, what were the beliefs that that were true to me. And so the reason that I think that's relevant to your question about um, uh, a sense of understanding or compassion in the writing is um, there are a lot of people with whom I disagree, who I know because I was once in their shoes in a sense. It was a different time. It was a different political reality. But 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 the fact that, you know, I when I had ideas very different from my ideas now, for example, I would have said that affirmative action is unfair. I would have I would have debated that to the end of time when I was like, let's say 19, maybe even 20. Um, and simultaneously, I was the same person that I am now. I was a good person. I was not I had I didn't have any hate in my heart. I was um, I based on the information sources that I had for over the course of my entire life, that was an idea that I formed. And then I found ways to rationalize it. Well, 
when my ideas changed and now in, you know, in my view, there's nothing more fair in the world than affirmative action. Um, it, it humbles me to understand that there are a lot of people. Now there are people, there are hateful, nasty people walking the earth as well. And that's a kind of different conversation, mm -hmm. but within the group of people who are, you know, against me and my ideas, I know because I lived it firsthand that many of them, what you're hearing come out of their mouth is um, a lifetime of from childhood onward, only only having Fox News on a television in the local pizza parlor or whatever. Um, and, and if given the opportunity, a lot of those people will change. And regardless of even who has the right ideas and who doesn't, I obviously still have my biases, but um, so much of our uh, political discourse is conflict driven in part because of my own uh, media industry profiting from that framework of of two sides battling and two heads arguing on cable news and so on. Um, that's really clearly not productive and it hasn't gotten us anywhere. It's only dug us further into a, a, a hole of polarization. And if you come to someone with not assuming that they're monstrous, uh, but rather just with a humble respect for, you know, that if, if you have different ideas, but you, but you also like want a fair world, your idea of what's fair is different. Let's talk about how you came by those ideas. And then maybe I'll tell you how I came by mine. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can't, you know, I, I can't write something that, that vilifies my book, by the way, for those who haven't read it is, is while it is called a memoir, it's very much a, um, uh, meditation on socioeconomic class in this country and the way that that do, um, intersects with race and gender and place and um, and and I do have I do have some some ideas going on in there, but it's not a polemic um, or or me sort of positioning myself as now let me lecture you uh, because a that doesn't work and and b it, it's just not how I see. Um, uh, human connection as relates to getting anything done. Hmm. Uh, so the, that's your first book. And then your second book is about, I have, it's my library copy and the library always puts the barcode right. Okay. There's the better copy of, of better view, the library copy. I like <laughs> the better view of um, the wonderful Dolly Parton. What is it about Dolly Parton? What, like, why not? And I, like Reba McIntyre or Loretta Lynn or Patsy Cline, like what is it about, I mean, now exhausted everyone I know in country music. Oh, Tammy Wynette. Uh, but what is it about Dolly Parton that you think is so, I don't know, it feels like reading your book that she is a connective force to so many different parts of our country, that so many people find a way to, to find themselves in her or find something about her that they, understand or it resonates with them. What does yeah, it for sure. I mean, the, the way that the, the book came to be actually, and it might seem sort of like a strange choice, like, oh, you go from this, you know, kind of um, lofty exploration of um, American identity and history to what it appears to be a celebrity biography. That's not what it is. No. Um, but uh, I, it actually was, I didn't intend for it to be a book. I'm very happy that it is now. Um, but when I was working on Heartland, I, I was under contract with my publisher after like 10 years of getting turned down by agents and, and publishers. And, um, and I saw, there's a great magazine called No Depression that uh, is, covers basically roots music in America and, and how that uh, is important in our to, our to our cultural fabric. And they had a new fellowship giving someone the opportunity, not for very much money, by the way, for frankly, for a writer, like kind of a poverty wage, but it was a rare opportunity to get paid to write really long on some way in which roots or country Americana music um, is relevant to um, contemporary culture and, and society and even politics. And I had been thinking a lot about Dolly Parton because she had, she was on tour. This was 2016, an election year that you might remember. Um, mm -hmm. And um, there were so many headlines about rural America as just, a, um, at least within the, the liberal press that, that I'm part of, 
well, I don't know if that's even the right term. Like I would say like the reasonable press, um, that the headlines about where I'm from, the people and the place tended to, to cast them as a sort of monolithic, um, moral scourge on the, the, you know, like a political stain on the current moment in this country. And it was like, I'm from that place and it's a lot more complicated than that. And then it became that the white working class was, was electing Donald Trump. They're his base. And I've written at length uh, in many different publications about why that's actually a, a, a pretty flawed take. Um, but it occurred to me, I was watching Dolly Parton, like, you know, dazzle her fans in um, New York City and then also like country folks that I know, she had this tour and a new album. And I thought, well, damned if she isn't from rural America. And to my mind, she's literally the opposite of Donald Trump <laughs> in terms of, um, she calls herself a Christian and, and she actually lives um, the, the values that, that supposedly um, uh, are, are contained in that, that religious ethos. She's a non-judgmental force of um, pretty unconditional love toward all groups. Um, she's put her career on the line before to stand with, um, well, something that comes to mind is the transgender uh, community years before that was even a mainstream discussion. She did a song for a movie called Trans America, mm -hmm. got some death threats for singing that song on the Academy Awards. Um, even though she's simultaneously considered this sort of like cleverly non-political figure, and I grew up with her music, of course, um, in a family of country music fans. And but I had never really considered her power and what makes her. I wasn't like a Dolly super fan. The, all the women that you just listed were on rotation just as much on our record player as Dolly was. Um, but I had, you know, I was a kid in the 80s, which was sort of like the peak of her sex symbol mm -hmm. um, incarnation. And I think she still is a sex symbol in many ways, but at that time, you know, she was middle-aged-ish and, you know, um, youthful and um, often just represented by her breasts, frankly, in by late night talk show hosts that I watched as a little girl. Um, it was such a like pervasive cultural joke, Dolly Parton equals big boobs that, there were like jokes on playgrounds that I played on as a child where little boys would like tell jokes that the punchline had to do with Dolly Parton's boobs. So as an adult, seeing her sort of in her fullness as now a kind of like, I don't know, universally beloved pop culture goddess, thought like there's something really interesting about that. And so I started kind of digging more into her um into her past and her, her story coming from poverty is quite famous, but the, the bumps along the way to her coming into this, you know, current fruition as, as an icon um, were, it, it's a fascinating story. And I saw in that story, so many of um, a kind, kind of big famous version of the same trials and tribulations that the women who raised me and who taught me how to be a feminist without ever actually using that word, um, I, I saw them in her story. And so, you know, Heartland is in many ways, I think a, a, a story that has a lot to do with, with gender. Um, the stars of the book really are my, my, grand, my maternal grandmother and my mother to some extent. Um, we rarely hear about working class women. The idea is usually like the white guy in a, a hard hat yeah. Um, and, and so this book, I think just kind of follows from that. I wrote it concurrently with writing Heartland for a magazine. And okay. then a couple of years ago, my publisher Scribner was like, you remember when you wrote about Dolly Parton? What if we put that in a book? And so I revised it pretty lightly. So it's kind of a snapshot of a moment when the Me Too movement was nascent. And at that same time, Dolly Parton was on stage, um, singing to people about, love and acceptance in the middle of uh, the dawn of the Trump era. Great. Well, it's a must read for everyone out there who likes Dolly Parton, loves Dolly Parton, is just intrigued. Um, and Danny, let's talk about 
the Raven. It was not a very good segue, but I'm segueing um, over to the Raven. I want to hear about the new space. The store is moving. Am I, you're yeah. moving into a new space, a bigger space. A bigger space? Yeah, we, I mean, the Raven has been at 6 East 7th Street in downtown Lawrence since Sarah was in college, since before that, since September 1987. We've been in the same spot, uh, basically. Um, but we uh, have decided to move for, for a lot of reasons. We found the new spot is right on Massachusetts Street, which is kind of the famous main drag in downtown Lawrence. Right now, we're kind of tucked away uh, half a block off of Mass, but we're moving right into the heart of it all. Uh, a, freshly renovated storefront. Um, a couple reasons for the move. Uh, we just got too busy. I mean, we've gotten, we've been so lucky to get a lot of attention and a lot of business and find a lot of new customers over the last couple of years. And we've really outgrown the space. Um, the new space is wheelchair accessible at both entrances, which is super important to us. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about being accessible and welcoming. And like, we had a really big blind spot in the the, the steps leading up to our front door. So we're, we're uh, really looking forward to welcoming um, people who get around in a multitude of ways. Um, we're going to double the, the kids section. We're going to um, increase our children's programming. We've got a back room to do all of our online order processing because even as we've reopened after the pandemic, the website sales haven't gone away. Uh, so we are um, busily sending books all across the country. We'll have a better space to do that. We're going to feature a ton of local art and local artists in there. It's really going to be um, a beautiful, our, we're, our, our original goal was to be the most beautiful bookstore in Kansas. Now I'm kind of aiming for the Midwest. I think this is gonna be the most beautiful bookstore in the Midwest. Uh, so it'll have that Raven flavor, but a lot of great, um, exciting new features. It'll be a really fun and comfortable place to work and browse. Um, we are weeks away. We don't have, it's such a huge project. We don't have an exact end date. Um, we've been saying it, it'll be a Leo if you're astrologically inclined. Um, so it'll, uh, yeah, me too. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're right now we're working on paint. We're working on doorknobs, uh, finishing the floor, uh, a couple windows need to replace. We need to paint signs on the front windows, but we're really getting there. It'll be really soon. So stay tuned to Raven social media for details about the new location. It'll be very exciting and historic. Even it's been 33 years. Wow. That's a big change. One of the things that makes indie bookstores so so unique is the author events, the live events. Mm -hmm. And I know during the pandemic, so many bookstores had to push those events um, online as, of course, look at the Mighty Blaze. That's how we came about. I'm curious if you can think about an event that you've held at the store that was particularly memorable. Like if you think about your live events, you think about, oh, this was the one. This is the story that you tell. I know, well, Sarah, you had yeah. your lunch at the store. Yeah. Right? I, well, it wasn't at the store. It was at Liberty Hall, which is a 750 seat theater that we sold out for the, the launch of Heartland. Uh, so it was perhaps the biggest book event that the Raven has ever done uh, in person. Um, and of course, it was magical and, and wonderful. Uh, so I think that and that actually is one of the ones that leaps to mind. Um, just to like sell out uh, a theater in the Midwest for an author talking about class and working class women, it's, it's amazing. It's one of the highlights of my career. Um, you know, we did, we did about 75 or 80 virtual events um, at the, over the pandemic. And I'll, for one, we had um, Hanif Abdurraqib for his new book, A Little Devil in America in conversation with Eve Ewing. And they're like best friends and they're both writers we adore at the Raven. And they had the most amazing and inspiring conversation. Um, and it was uh, one of the times where we, I think we actually managed to recapture the magic online of an in-person author event. Like it, it can be done. Um, and then we had Sarah for She Come By at Natural Two. She was in conversation with Chuck Mead talking about country music and, and Dolly Parton, um, which is a super cool event. So um, we love the events. We can't wait uh, to get back to it. We, again, I wish I could tell you more. We have plans in the works. We're actively working on a return to in-person events. Um, it'll happen in the new space. We're not exactly sure when, but uh, we can't wait. Cause that's, again, uh, it's, you know, it's like drink every time Danny says community, but like it's another way we build community is uh, to actually convene the literary community. It's really important to not only give people a chance to meet and talk to their favorite authors and get the signatures, but just to put all the literary people into the same room, I think is really important work. And it's one of the most important jobs of an independent bookstore. And we, we absolutely can't wait to get back to it. Well, it ties very much to what Sarah was talking about, that the way that the world, your perspective can change when you spend time with other people whose 
perspectives are different, when you get the opportunity to be open to books you didn't know about. So a bookstore's role in a community, uh, we should have a drinking game for how many times we say community. <laughs> but I mean, a bookstore's role is totally measured, right? It's really quite priceless in how it it creates connection and, and a, you know. Um, the other thing that bookstores do is make excellent recommendations for books. So obviously we want everyone to check out Sarah's yeah. I know I have family members who are Leos who have birthdays coming up who will be getting Heartland oh, for their oh. birthday. Um, actually, that is true. I'm not just saying that because you're on the show. Um, but I am really curious, what are people in Lawrence, Kansas reading, Danny? What are, what are books? I've, are? This, I have to talk about this book because it's, I think, a perfect example of what we talk about with small businesses and community. And there you go, drink again. Um, this is Lady Bird Collected by Meg Hereford. Um, Meg is the owner of Lady Bird Diner, which is right across the street from us. I um, mean, the, the genesis of this book is, is amazing. So at the beginning of the pandemic, um, Meg, like all the other restaurants, shut down. And Lady Bird has always been focused on placemaking. So they never had to go food to begin with. And they just weren't set up for it. They have a tiny kitchen. And their whole their whole goal was convening and getting people into their little space. So they they didn't they decided not to do carry out food through the pandemic. What they did instead, it started just Meg was trying to clean out the fridge. She just made box lunches and gave them out for free to whoever needed them that first week. And there was such a huge demand that she converted her diner into a food pantry um, and sold two. She gave away two hundred lunches every day throughout the entire pandemic, which was wonderful and a much needed community service, but of course um, expensive. And so one of her ideas on how to fund this was to put together an essay collection. Um, and she's a prolific, she's, you think I'm good on social media, you should follow Meg uh, because she's the real queen. Um, and so she writes these little mini essays and she put those together and some new writings into a, into a book. And um, you know, I helped with it. A couple other folks in the community helped with it. It was printed at University Press of Kansas um so like this is a, a totally kansas project and it went to fund the the meal program um which is important and that alone is reason to buy the book but it's also an amazing piece of writing and like these are voices you just don't hear from this is a, a working class woman a restaurant owner in a small town in the midwest like this is a story it's an amazing story of someone doing great work feeding people and building community uh, in an oft overlooked part of the country um, and doing a really damn good job of telling that story. Um, so that's Lady Bird Collected. Um, Lady Bird has now be slowly begun the process of reopening, but you should still totally order the book um, and read it. Um, and once when you come to Lawrence, like breakfast at Lady Bird and stop to the Raven to browse, it's, you couldn't find think of a better way to spend a morning. Excellent. Sarah, are you working on another project? Is there something that we can look forward to reading from you down the line. Um, an eye out for, or is it too soon to talk about? Something? Well, it might be too soon to talk about, but I will say um, I've definitely. Um, usually, I'm kind of juggling freelance journalism with book writing, and I've sort of um, put my journalistic career on on pause to 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 focus on uh, longer projects. So. I guess that's all I'm going to say for now. But oh, we um, can't wait. <laughs> but you're but, teasing us. I can't wait to hear about it. Uh, but but thanks for for the question, and uh, it's always an honor when when somebody cares to know what you're up to. So oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm curious. We have a lot of writers who watch our show, and both of you are published authors. In addition to doing other things, you Sarah, you've published books. You're also a journalist, Danny. I don't actually know how you sleep. You do a lot <laughs> and, and you're a poet. I'm curious, how do you protect your writing life? That's the question we people are always really curious about. How do you protect your writing life when you have a lot of competing priorities? Danny, go ahead. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, it's it's always a balance. Like there's no, there's no silver bullet. Um, it's different for everybody, I think. Um, one thing I like, um, I wrote through um, early fatherhood. Um, and that's one of the reasons I landed on poetry is because poetry happens in little chunks. Um, it was actually a really difficult transition to switch to a book length nonfiction project because it required more sustained attention and, and research time. Um, 
so I mean, aside from just writing poems, because you can write a poem quickly, uh, I think you like you totally treat it as a priority. Like it's it's a professional responsibility, writing time, just like your job or, or grocery shopping or whatever else. I, I think you're allowed to prioritize it, even when it feels like your writing career isn't going well, even if you haven't been published yet, like you take it seriously and, and carve out that time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, but it's also something I struggle with. Uh, it took, and there, there, there are weeks when I don't write. Um, and I think one other thing is like the more I read, the more I want to write. And so I think writing and reading are related to me and they're kind of symbiotic. And so like if you abandon your reading life, your writing life will probably suffer mm -hmm. as well. Uh, so just making sure to prioritize both of those. How you do that in your world, I think depends a lot on your schedule and what your life looks like. Uh, but just making a serious effort to, to, uh, dedicate yourself to both. Excellent. Sarah, any advice for the writers uh, out there watching? I, I agree with everything Danny said. And that, that's an, another reason, by the way, that the Raven is a, an incredible place. It's, it's owned and run by a, a fine poet and someone who is a writer himself. And so to have that kind of mutual understanding between bookseller and who, who is also someone who is creating books is like, and, and the authors that, um, uh, whose books he sells is is pretty amazing. But um, as far as um, kind of building on Danny's tips, I would say, first I want to say um, that how I answer this question or feel this question is, it would have been very different in when I was like, in my early 20s, I was actually already working on Heartland, believe it or not. And um, it was a lot harder to, to find that time when, when I, I was literally in poverty. So I was often holding mm -hmm. holding three jobs that yeah. you know were, were not fulfilling, but just for the sake of making sure I could pay the bills. And um, I'm just gonna be honest for anybody who's listening and going through that particular experience. Um, it's, it's almost impossible in that situation and it's, um, it, you, you can't get through that um, attempted juggling act probably without, um, uh, I, I would go so far as to say harm to oneself. Like I, I was, my devotion to getting that writing done alongside all of the things that I had to do from out of, out of just financial imperative um, was um, so draining that it took a toll on my mental and physical health. Um, as I got into more, you know, grounded kind of career track sort of um, professions, then it became at, at least still immensely challenging, but but much more tenable. Um, and in in that case, which I think is to your question, um, I find that I love what Danny said about reading because, and you could expand that to just like staying inspired. So we're living in a capitalist society that doesn't give a shit if you're inspired. It only cares if you're working and what are you producing. And inspiration for many creative people requires a little bit of freaking space to just be. So if you can somehow find that space, carve it out, you don't even necessarily say, now my methodology is every morning from six to seven, I write before I go to the gym. It's like, I have never been that person. Um, I am a morning writer, but I'm not a daily writer. And I had to just like stop feeling bad about it because it's just not how I work. Um, but, but every day you should be carving a space to just be. Mm -hmm. And within that space, that is where the inspiration and the thing that you have to write will force itself mm -hmm. out whether you're making time for it or not. Mm -hmm. um, it is, is my experience. And, um, and I guess the last thing I would add to that, because we're in an era of so many distractions that happen to be, um, you know, very much tied to the capitalist structure, um, making your life as like the the distractions of your life get very lean. Like if, if you can't totally get off social media, then somehow really practice a discipline about it. Um, sometimes they're going to be now that we're hopefully reentering times of like getting together with folks, they're going to be times you have to say no, because there's no, um, again, like this, the world that we're living in, it is in no way engineered to allow you to write a book. And in fact, in many ways, it is constructed um, in, in direct opposition to that pursuit. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's, I don't think anybody has ever said that it's easy, but um, 
most most fulfilling thing I've ever done. Thank you. That was great advice from both of you. Danny, I have a, a final question for you, which is a question we ask all of the booksellers. Running a book, running a successful bookstore is part hard work, part luck, and part what else? <laughs> oh, that's a tricky question, and I think it's a complicated one. It's actually, um, I think, unfortunately, it's a little bit privileged right now. And this is something I'm working on really hard through advocacy for the ABA board is making sure more people can get to be in my spot and running a business. It's really hard to start or buy a bookstore without um, already having money. So uh, it's, a, it's a bummer answer. I feel like you're looking for the, the tie it up. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's also fun. Um, if, you, if you can get to it, it's fun. And I'm working really hard to make sure uh, that the, the right group of talented booksellers can get to this spot too. That's actually a wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I we have a giveaway. So Amanda Ginger Summers, who, you're out there somewhere. Um, congratulations! You won. You've won a copy of She Come By It Natural. So if you can just email us at a mighty blaze at gmail .com with your address, we will follow up with you. Um, Danny and Sarah, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Oh, well, I was. Yeah. It was such a pleasure. I, I really enjoyed speaking with both of you, reading your work, and I hope everyone else uh, takes this opportunity to follow the links below the broadcast to go to the Raven Bookstore online and purchase Sarah's books, Danny's books, or if you're in Lawrence, Kansas or in the area, stop by. Um, to our viewers, if you like today's show, and we hope you did, please subscribe to A Mighty Blazes page on Facebook so you'll get notified of all of our events or hop over to our website, amightyblaze.com, to subscribe to our newsletter. And join us back here next week at 4 p.m. Eastern time for another episode of Authors Love Bookstores. Until then, be well and keep reading. And thank you again, Danny and Sarah. Thank you.